Hey, in December 2020, Pope Francis released this book, Let Us Dream the Path to a Better Future. So it's only six, seven months ago. You know what the fly cover says right here on the inside? In the COVID crisis, the beloved shepherd of over 1 billion Catholics has seen the cruelty and inequity of our society more vividly exposed than ever before. He has also seen in the resilience, generosity, and creativity of so many people the means to rescue our society, our economy, and our planet. In direct, powerful prose, Pope Francis urges us not to let the pain be in vain. Over here on page 15, Francis goes on to say, An ark awaits us to carry us to a new tomorrow. COVID-19 is our Noah moment. As long as we can find our way to the ark of the ties that unite us of love and of a common belonging, unquote. Now, in order to understand the remainder of my reaction, I want to just sum up in one paragraph uh, what I think has been going on for about the last 18 months or so here. So, so you know where I'm coming from. It seems to me that a group of ambitious, power-seeking utopians has hijacked what was probably a laboratory leak in a biowarfare facility in China. They hijacked what happened and in a play to speed up the attainment of their agenda and intoxicated with tower builder, I'm, I'm referring to, to Genesis chapter 11, intoxicated with kind of a tower builder mentality. These people have used their influence, their technocratic influence and financial influence to, to lead uh, p political people to do their bidding. And the result has been a, a dramatic smash against the personal liberty and the personal freedom of most people here on planet Earth. Human freedoms have been stripped away. So let's take a look at this book now. Pope Francis is all right with that, and it's not a surprise. I mean, if you go back to 1863, Pope Pius IX uh, said this in one of his encyclicals. He said that the idea that, quote, liberty of conscience is each man's personal right, unquote, he says in that same space, he says that, that is a totally false and erroneous opinion. So no surprise that the current pope doesn't see personal rights in quite that high pattern that you and I might. So in his book, Pope Francis gives uh, basically almost unqualified endorsement of the way governments have handled this crisis. Whatever you or I think of it, we can know what the Pope thinks. So let me give you a few quotes here from uh, straight out of his book. He fully legitimizes their use of authority to enforce social distancing, masking, and travel restrictions. Listen to these. Some media have used this crisis to persuade people that foreigners are to blame, that coronavirus is little more than a little bout with the flu, that everything will soon return to what it was before, and that restrictions necessary for people's protection amount to an unjust demand of an interfering state. Here's another quote. Social distancing is a necessary response to a pandemic. Here's another one. Some of the protests during the coronavirus crisis have brought to the fore an angry spirit of victimhood. But this time, among people who are victims only in their own imagination, those who claim, for example, that being forced to wear a mask is an unwarranted imposition by the state, yet who forget or do not care those who cannot rely, for example, on social security or who have lost their jobs. Well, we're mixing a couple of pieces together here, aren't we? Here's another quote. Some groups protested, refusing to keep their distance, marching against travel restrictions as if measures that governments must impose for the good of their people constitute some kind of political assault on autonomy or personal freedom. Looking to the common good is much more than the sum of what is good for individuals. It means having a regard for all citizens and seeking to respond effectively to the needs of the least fortunate, unquote. As Pope Francis says in his view, quote, it is all too easy for some to take an idea, in this case, for example, personal freedom and turn it into an ideology creating a prism through which they judge everything. Uh, but personal freedom is not just an, just an idea, one idea among many. It is the central question in the battle between good and evil. God wants us to use the gift of freedom responsibly. I mean, this is a question of who we will worship and who we won't. It all comes down from personal freedom. But for the past 18 months, the world has experienced a, a continuous conditioning to coming to a time when you just, the government says to jump and you say, how high? That's what it's been. It's been learning by, by conditioning, forced conditioning, compelling, learning to obey the government no matter what. 
Revelation, the Bible's Revelation chapter 13, talks about a time when the governments will tell you who can buy and who can sell, you know, who can buy and who can't. And they're going to use force to compel. That's all in Revelation chapter 13. This, this isn't something we just made up or something that we haven't known about. This has been in the Bible for 2,000 years. And we can be quite certain that the fundamental argument of this book, that human governments are right to use their force to compel obedience, we can be sure that that's exactly what will happen at Revelation 13. It's already been foretold. It's already been foreseen by John the Revelator. And you know the way it's going to be too, don't you? The argument is going to be, it's for the good of all. It's for the good of everybody. That's why we do this. That's why we're going to obey what the government says. It's for the common good. Well, the common good is the fundamental argument that the Pope goes back to again and again and again here in his book. No surprise. All through this book, the Pope reinforces the common good argument, and he attacks, attacks, attacks individualism. Now, a lot of this book, too, is also the Pope journeying down. He takes us on a journey down through Buzzword Alley. And so the kind of things you'd expect if you look at the mainstream narrative, it's carefully crafted narrative today in the news, those are the kind of things you certainly see all through this book. They're strung through. They're like a bunch of, like a bunch of prayer beads. They're all there. So you know what they are. And let me just give you some exact quotes so that you're not just taking my word for it. All the references are in the video here. We must redesign the economy so that it can offer every person access to a dignified existence while protecting and regenerating the natural world. Here's another quote. Reversing the processes of dehumanization in our current world will depend on the participation of the people's movements. They are sowers of a new future, promoters of the change we need to put the economy at the service of the people to build peace and justice and to defend Mother Earth. Mother Earth. All right, here's another one. He's talking about the right to work. He says, people have, he says, quote, the right to safe and decent work. Another quote just like this. Labor is, he says, a right and duty for all men and women. Labor is a right. Here's another quote. I believe it is time to explore concepts like the universal basic income, UBI, also known as the negative income tax, an unconditional flat payment to all citizens, which could be dispersed through the tax system. How will we deal with the hidden pandemics of this world, the pandemics of hunger and violence and climate change? And of course, climate change is an idea all the way through this book, said in many different, different ways. Here's one more. Left to their own devices, markets have generated vast inequality and huge ecological damage. Market forces cannot on their own deliver the goal we now need, to regenerate the natural world by living more sustainably and more soberly while meeting the needs of those who have been harmed by or excluded from that economy until now. We need an economy with goals beyond the narrow focus on growth that puts human dignity, jobs, and, the, and ecological regeneration at its core. He's worried about the economy. He's worried about climate change. Like I said, this is a trip down buzzword alley. Well, you might ask, did, uh, did George Floyd sort of creep into this book so much? Wait, no surprise, he did. He's in there. He's in there three or four times. George Floyd is mentioned. In fact, the Pope even says this. He says that the protests surrounding the death of George Floyd are healthy indignation. Yes, healthy indignation. So burning down a Wendy's is healthy indignation. Looting and rioting is healthy indignation. I'll make a note of that. But now more interesting to me is what the Pope has to say about uh, fundamentalists and fundamentalism. This is very telling. He attacks the individual and individualism all the way through his book. But listen to what he says. He, he singles out so-called fundamentalists. And here's a couple of things he has to say. Fundamentalist mindsets offer you an attitude and a single closed way of thinking as a substitute for the kind of thinking that opens you to truth. Whoever takes refuge in fundamentalism is afraid of setting out on the road to truth. Here's another one. I learned not to demand absolute certainties in everything. And here's one more. I see the truth lying outside of us, always beyond us, but beckoning us through our consciences. So the truth is out there. The truth is out there. But you know what? It's, it's always just, just out of reach there, there somewhere. Um, but I guess the Pope might be able to reach further than some of us so we can get to that truth. Here's another observation. The Pope doesn't like people holding views of their own. He doesn't like people who are holding views outside the carefully crafted mainstream narratives. I guess it gives him shivers down his spine. He's nervous when people operate outside of the utopian consensus. 
and so he warns against different kinds of violence. And what's interesting to me is, and I'll have the references at the notes at the end here, he especially is concerned about what he calls verbal violence. Verbal violence, that's right. And as soon as you say that uh, speaking out is verbal violence, now you've created a, a pathway to censor it and to eliminate that talk. Another personal freedom uh, down the circular file. But hey, no problem. It's what we would expect here. Now, in this book, the Pope makes some weak critiques of technocracy, uh, you know, but I don't think Bill Gates or, or Fauci or any of these guys, they're, they're not going to listen to him, and so he doesn't really put much energy into it. But let's come back to this idea about the Pope uh, saying that we are having a Noah moment. That's an interesting line, isn't it? A Noah moment. So this book was co-authored by another individual, Austin Ivory, and he says something a little bit intriguing here near the end of the book. Let me share it with you. Outwardly, the Pope in lockdown, cut off from the people, looked helpless. Yet those close to him told me the opposite, that he was energized by what he saw as a threshold moment and the movement of spirits beneath its surface. Page 142. Because you see, this threshold moment idea matches kind of what he said back on page 15 here about the the Noah moment. An ark awaits us to carry us to a new tomorrow. COVID-19 is our Noah moment. As long as we can find our way to the ark of the ties that unite us, of love and of a common belonging. Now, the Bible does tell us that the flood was a truly transitional time for the earth, uh, for sure. Genesis chapters 6, 7, and 8, that's the flood. But it's most difficult to see in COVID a, a change of this magnitude, kind of an epochal change. Because COVID, you know that uh, when I look at this, clearly this crisis that we're in right now, like we've never seen in our lives or anybody else has maybe just about seen, this crisis is 75% contrived. And the 25% of it that is authentic crisis is mostly that because we're at the storm front of a vast renegotiation of personal liberty in which it's a new view is being uh, imposed upon us. We're not, we're not doing any negotiating. It's just being imposed on us. And in this renegotiation, governments and their agents are currently, presently, this moment, they're in the process of usurping rights and liberties they have no authority to take from us. So we're living in a very strange time. But here at the end of the Bible in Revelation 18, and sometime we probably should sit down and really talk about Revelation 18 and what is Babylon. Revelation 18 points us to the final development of this very kind of scenario. When the leaders of the governments and the merchants of the earth make their play for global hegemony. And what's fascinating is how, how easy it's become in just the last 18 months to sort of see this, see how it can play out as we look across the horizon. It kind of looks like it's within sight now, but maybe. We can look over the, out over the, the mist in the distance and we can sort of see what it might look like to see that. And what would you see? Immense wealth concentrated in the hands of a few. You'd have tech monopolies censoring speech. You'd have a small number of hyper-rich people with a sort of, uh, we're going to save the world and remake it in our image kind of attitude there, kind of like Genesis 11, tower building. You'd have power concentrated, wealth concentrated in these a small number of vastly rich, hyper-rich corporations. That's what you would see. So just go and look out your window. And that's what you'll see today. And you would have religious thinking manifesting itself in uh, very much in contradiction to the Bible. And in Revelation 18, you would see that ultimately that all fails. It all comes tumbling down as God's judgment comes in and destroys it. So that's kind of an interesting piece. And so it's from our standpoint in the flow of time, our present standpoint, how we can begin to see how this could actually happen in our time. A few years ago, you or I wouldn't have wouldn't have said, I think I could see how that could be. You wouldn't say that you could see that on the horizon, but here we are. Now, this book was co-authored by another individual. His name is Austin Ivory, and uh, near the back of the book, 142 or about here, he, he has an interesting item for us. He has a quotation here. Outwardly, the Pope in lockdown cut off from the people, looked helpless, yet those close to him told me the opposite, that he was energized by what he saw as a threshold moment and the movement of spirits beneath its surface, unquote. Now, this threshold moment idea matches, of course, what he said back on page 15 about the Noah time. Remember, an ark awaits us to carry us to a new tomorrow. COVID-19 is our Noah moment. 
Now, Austin Ivory fancies the Pope to be the world's spiritual director. That's page 142. He thinks God may be sent Pope Francis to take us through this time. But if the current Pope is working in combination with the kings and the merchants of the earth to strip away liberties that God gave us, to train us to follow what governments say in opposition to our religious liberty, if the movement of, quote, spirits beneath the surface, unquote, isn't the movement of God's spirit, then might it not be that we're somewhere near the conclusion of the battle between good and evil, that God is about to finish things, and that the Pope maybe is standing not exactly on the right side of the question? Could it be? Could it be that the most important spiritual director that you or I could be in touch with today would be Jesus, our great high priest in, the, in heaven, that he's soon to return literally and utterly burn Babylon, all of it, with fire. Beware the dreams of false prophets, even those wearing capes and crucifixes. By the way, if you found this uh, presentation interesting, each morning we're just taking three or four minutes to go through the book of Jeremiah, just verse by verse, and there's a lot of pieces in Jeremiah that recording the downfall of the kingdom of Judah, and a lot of parallels from that day to your day and mine here in 2021.